Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Trusted CI webinar for April 27th, 2020. I'm your host, Jeanette Dapheide. Trusted CI is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about Trusted CI can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is trustworthy decision making in artificial intelligence with Ariane Duresi. Uh, Ariane is a professor of computer science at Indiana University, Purdue University in Indianapolis. Um, and before we begin, I have a few items to note. Uh, first, this presentation is being recorded. Second, participants are welcome to ask questions during the session uh, using the chat box. So click on the chat link and you'll pull up the chat. And we will uh, take questions at the, end of, at the end of the presentation as well. And with that, I welcome Ariane. Ariane, welcome. Thank you. Yes. I can hear you. Let, let me share the slides. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Ariane Duresi, and thank you for the presentation. I'm with the Department of Computer Science at Indiana University, Purdue University. So here is my information website and email if you want to reach me. So this presentation is about trustworthy decision making and artificial intelligence. So this is one of the main focus of, of my research. But I, I also have done and continue doing research on networking, security in general, but this is somehow closer to my heart these days. So I, I recognize the support of NSF and USDA for some of the work which I present. So with this one, let me start. Sorry. So basically, this is kind of overview of the presentation. I will kind of make a case why we, we need uh, to have some trust on this decision making and algorithms and AI. So this is the new umbrella now. So and I will introduce our trust. We have our own trust management system. And which we think would be a kind of good kind of tool to, to cover this uh, need which is emerging nowadays to, to have trustworthy decision making. So we have validated our kind of system in some uh, real data and mostly on stock market data and, uh, and I will explain that it's not that I really was going after money at all so it would be great but some of my students are doing that, but my main goal was another one. So, and then I will focus mostly on this uh, decision making for water, food, energy. So this is a large project funded by USDA and we have done a lot of work here. So basically it's much more mature work and real work. And also I will, we have done also other work regarding this trustworthiness of systems. Uh, for example, we have applied how to build kind of uh, more trustworthy computing system, could be cloud computing, could be internet of things, similar things. We have used how, I mean, the uh, system to filter uh, fake news and fake news in social networks. So nowadays this is really becoming a big problem. And even in, in this very bad time, we are living through this pandemic. So there is so much fake information around and in these times could be also very dangerous. I don't know if you have seen some of them, but really it's crazy. So just a couple of days ago, I mean, you know that French Nobel Prize said something about how the virus is done. Anyway, he has his own opinions and he's a scientist and Nobel Prize. But then suddenly, I mean, they, they started to send some, some uh, from another Nobel Prize from Japan making up. A, a, and really people debugged that it was totally fake. But you see, I mean, it was hurting even Experts, I, I mean, some groups of I mean, experts in this field, I mean, they, they, for some reason, they, they, they fail for that. So then another place we, ha we have used this, uh, I collaborating with some of my colleagues, they, they do prediction of crimes using machine learning techniques. And we somehow put humans in this loop and police and we have very interesting results there. Now I will try my best, but I mean, the, this part here is both, I, I think I will be able to cover because we have kind of short time. 
for the rest, I might give just some ideas. And anyway, the details are in the slide, but we might not have time for that. And also, I'm available anytime. I mean, I can send you papers and whatever you need. So let me start with kind of uh, some citations so from some top guys. So basically, we have been using models uh, and computers for a long time. It's not that suddenly now we discovered computers. I mean, since the, the beginning and even before computers, people use tools and so on. Now, all these are based on some models and some, some algorithms. And unfortunately, uh, that's the meaning of a model. A model cannot be 100% as reality. So uh, you have this great saying, uh, this is one of the top uh, statisticians, uh, all models are wrong and some of them are useful. And this is very unfortunate to illustrate this uh, saying with what's going on right now. So uh, probably you have noticed that these uh, models, they use epi epidemiology models to make predictions, they, they are kind of fading because they, they have very large errors. And I don't know, this is also a failure from the research point of view because these models really are good to explain the history. So to teach, for example, you can go a few years in the future, they might see the, what we went through and they will discover, okay, this curve is a good day. This is the replication, average replication, and that's fine. But to predict the future, they are not good because the errors are very large. And the, the problem is at the root. The, the statistics they, they use, they use, uh, was done to be used with, with deterministic numbers, and actually we, we are dealing with random numbers. For example, the replication, uh, the average is not good because there is so much, I mean, randomness and variation, and that reflects on, on the results. And also it's hurting. Actually, this is really going in the root of my talk because people are seeing so much errors and they don't trust any more models. They say, come on, I mean, you, you were so wrong before, I mean, just a week before shooting random numbers. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, they start talking 200, 100, 60, whatever. So anyway, so the bottom line is that we have to be very careful with models and, uh, and algorithms because they are, not, they are not the reality because the reality is data. It's experiments in our field is data. And again, this goes the third thing along with them. So basically we have to be aware about the model uh, errors. And actually for time being, it's difficult for algorithms somehow to self judge probably in the future that, that will happen to that we have algorithm kind of judging other algorithm, algorithms. But for the time being, especially when a lot of er, uh, risk is involved, we have to re rely on people. So that's why my kind of field is in this kind of human machine collaboration. So on, on one hand, we recognize that AI and algorithms really they are very powerful tools to kind of augment our capability and complement us. But still, as I said, for, for we need to be in charge because there are many issues uh, which, which machines, it's not their fault. I mean, as I explained in the next slide, basically there are many issues which goes beyond machines. So, and finally we have to create this, if we are to collaborate, like even humans to humans, we need kind of platform. So how we judge each other, I mean, uh, how we learn from each other. And who knows, even machines could judge us. I mean, when I consider human machines for, yeah, for the time being, we are considering ourselves in charge, but uh, who knows, the machines m might judge us too, or could be machine to machine. So basically, I believe in the future, uh, pr the problems will be so large that, we need some supervision from algorithm too. So anyway, this is uh, what I uh, trying to do. So basically this collaboration, I call them actors, could be humans and machine, could be any kind of, kind of combination of them. And I believe that uh, basically th this collaboration has to be based on trust. So, and I explain it a little bit because usually I get in trouble with uh, the meaning of trust and, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm glad you are mute because otherwise <laughs> I might have problems with what do you call trust. And if we start talking about that, probably we never finish. But anyway, I will, as I will say, our, our view is very pragmatic. Trust in our case means that how much you believe that the, the machine is right or the solution is right. So with that one, let me go in. Anyway, this is just one slide. We are writing a whole paper on this and other people have 
uh, are working on this. So basically, this is a big wave now, human-machine collaboration or human in the loop. There are different ways to call it and funding from Department of Defense, NSF. And I, I think this is a big wave and really, really we have to, to deal with this. So some of the needs training machines. So if the information you're looking is not the, in the data set, what do you expect? I mean, machine cannot do magic and, and discover other data sets. So but even selecting data sets. The big issue is to ex test and explain machines. So how, I mean, as anything, you have to test it. And basically how reliable, reliable is that solution in those conditions and so on and with that data, big need is to explain it because many times this, for example, simple algorithm somehow it's, we, we might have a feeling that uh, how that solution fits in, in the big scheme, but usually, I mean, for example, if it's machine learning or neural network, basically you, we might not have a clue how they, they reach the decision. The decision might be right or wrong, but I mean, if you cannot explain, for example, talking with doctors, they said it's impossible to, to really use something which we don't understand. So another big field is this, how you, can you apply the solution or not? For example, we have a great application which really fits here. So the solution could be great, but usually in real life people deal with interest. So you might have a group of people, they might have different interests, could be profit or whatever, and somehow it, it's not a question of finding the perfect solution, optimal solution. It's a question of negotiating. So basically uh, the machine might, might generate solutions for them or a result, but somehow they don't like it because uh, they lose money or they lose other things. So, so then uh, basically we have to control machines. Finally, we, we cannot leave. I mean, control but you have seen those sci-fi movies and, and uh, you see those guys I mean they're good at predicting we have seen f movies about pandemics and never thought that we will go through but also we have seen Terminator so basically it might not be far away the Terminator situation and also the risk we have to make a trade-off between the risk and, and how much we trust the system for example if the risk is very high also we have to make sure that we, we can trust it could be solutions which the risk is so high and the error is kind of very high and we might say look we cannot even trust at all i mean and on the final thing ethics so yeah, people are even working to put some ethics in machines but i mean for the time being that's kind of monopoly of, of people so basically there are many needs and as i said as any kind of collaboration basically trust it it's the root of collaboration, even between people so it's kind of major human feature. It's part of the evolution. And actually it's covered by many disciplines, psychology, so, uh, sociology. Now they have, they're coining new terms, neurophilosophy, neurosociology, and basically it, they are very interesting studies. I'm not expert on them. I just look for kind of as a hobby. They're going kind of relating, uh, let's say, social functions and social activities to the brain activities to especially the cortex so it goes in the learning so we learn as we learn everything also we learn uh, how, how to deal with each other how to have a society how to and all of this even trust it's part of it and it's really essential in all decision making big or small no matter what our brain somehow how it does i don't know some some day they, they might even figure out and as i said there is very uh, hot field of research on how to relate brain activities and these things but somehow it does so we, we have good feeling and bad feeling so we somehow measure things so and what we are trying to do we are trying to take this uh, let's say human feature and, and put in computers because that's what we do use computers in, in make decisions now as i said always i, I get in, in trouble with the meaning of trust because that's reality. Basically, there are many things which we don't have a real definition or definition is very fuzzy. And, and somehow we live with that. For example, what, what does it mean friendship? What does it mean love? Do we have a definition? Do we have a definition even for vegetables? So how many vegetables? People keep arguing if tomato is vegetable or fruit. So basically, there are many things which really we don't have a uh, everybody somehow has a definition and by the way I, i'm working with some people for many years 
and we have reached an agreement or a deal. Let, let us not even use the word trust because anytime I bring trust, they have something else in mind. So basically, that's why we are very pragmatic and what we call trust, we have found this definition. Somehow, how much you, you kind of are willing to, to uh, take a risk based on some belief that somebody will do something. And again, it's in, it includes uncertainty. So, but as I said, that's what it is. And somehow this science, for, for me also was a novelty, I come from kind of, uh, exact scientists, but this is not exact science. Even I explained to my students, to my collaborators. So don't expect that you will have like in physics, a, a, a law which really you can cal calculate the, the force between two bodies or two electrons. This is, uh, if you get something which has kind of some uh, inside and basically, but don't expect that the, the type of deterministic solution. On the other hand, it's better than nothing. And, and uh, that's what we show in the result. And you can improve our scheme basically to, to, to make more and more trustworthy decisions. So basically, let me explain uh, our approach. So we have, I told you, we have kind of uh, our system of trust. And I, I think this, I, I mean, of course, this is my baby and I have to say a good thing about this. By the way, there are many other trust systems and I, I don't argue that ours is better than others. But uh, what I can say is that ours is simple. It's simple, very flexible. And basically, this is a very simple idea which opened the door to the rest that we, we consider trust like physical measurement. So for example, we, we measure weight, we measure length, I mean, in centimeters and pounds, whatever it is, the unit. So we think that trust also is like that. Somehow our brain, for example, think about a friend, how you become best friends. Most likely during the experience, I mean, our brain counts good experience and bad experience. At some point, if the good experience is overwhelming, that person becomes our best friend. And it's, it's a lot of psychology research on this one, and I don't want to go there. But basically, of course, there is not 100% like a physical measurement, because again, that there is uh, subjective, especially if you involve people. But anyway, uh, this is the starting point as uh, basically why this very useful, because once we can see the trust kind of as physical measurement, we can use the, the whole math behind it. So measurements have their own theory, very well developed, and usually the theory is related to errors because again, when you do measurements, two are the major things, the value you are measuring and with what error. So if you know the error somehow, uh, as one of the sayings was saying before I presented, it's essential. So basically th this is what we, we, we try to capture, the, the value of uh, that assessment of trust and with what kind of error. So, and I will come back to that one with some more details, but anyway, let's go to the big uh, scene. So basically, uh, this is how our trust system works. So basically, depending on application, we have to do trust modeling. And this is probably the most difficult part because this is more kind of art than, than a science. So basically, in each application, we have to really do the best we can to, to model in, in, like measurements. Now, after we do that, we, we go in our system, this is kind of uh, the, ma the math of measurement uh, theory. And this is a lot of things here are kind of standard, but th this is the, the real advantage of our system because it's very flexible, can allow any uh, dependency on, on the context. So basically somehow the, the first one, this trust model, this is totally dependent on the context application. Here there is some dependence, but also the, there is some things which uh, are kind of standard. And then after you do this trust assessment of whatever you're trying to do in that application, you make the decision based on that. And of course the decision based on the current. So basically these are the three major steps of uh, our system. And in all applications, I will show you, it's, it's the same scheme, but it, it's totally different, especially this part here, it's totally different. And also this part here depends totally on the application. So anyway, let me go, I, I won't, kind of bother you with a lot of math because I mean, this is a short presentation. As I said, this is the, the math of uh, me measurements coming back to our system. So we can see just the, the impression. So it's kind of uh, mean of the results you have. So you have 
10 assessments, you do some, some mean of that, it's simple. And then the error is the key. Now, usually in our, I mean, our format behind the scene, they work with error, but to make it more human acceptable, we translate in, in, in confidence, which somehow it's the inverse of error, not exactly, but somehow we have worked on that to, to give some features. So basically, because people, that's what they want. I mean, confidence, it, it looks kind of better than error. So anyway, these are some features of the error. Uh, this confidence of busy more measurements you do, basically more uh, sure you are about the, uh, the results. So that's how the, the confidence goes up. So this is another explain, uh, great, uh, let's say, use of that uh, measurement theory, the math. So basically, if you know, you, you are able to have a formula how you kind of aggregate trust, doesn't matter, the formula depends on the application. Then if you know the formula and you know error of each step, you can really summarize the error of the, the whole uh, measure, I mean, the process. So this comes kind of for free from uh, measurement theory. And this is great really because uh, you, could, you, you might have any formula, this function here could be any kind of complex or not complex or sim doesn't matter. And this is a real great benefit. Now, here comes kind of, because this is kind of marriage between, let's say, a math of uh, measurement theory and, and some ideas we get some, from psychology. For example, they talk about uh, trust inference or transitivity. So basically this friend of friends, so basically you are friends with B and B is with Z, how much you are friends with Z. So basically how much, if you are able to have the trust values between these two pairs, how much is the A to Z? And again, you can have any formula here. So basically, basically it totally depends on application. For example, we, to, to make it simple, we use this one a lot, just multiplication, okay? But you could have anything, could be as a minimum, maximum, that, that totally depends on application. And it, this is the real value of our system. If you can come up with a formula which fits better the application, we are able to, to handle the error. The other major function is this aggregation because trust could come not only from friend of friends, but also could have parallel. So basically you have B and C are your friends and they talk to you about Z, but not necessarily they agree. So how you summarize this? Again, this is open to similar to the previous case, any kind of formula you want to, to use. And we have used some formulas, is averaging, weighted mean, some probably few union. So basically this is the fantasy, it's the, the limit here, but more than the fantasy, you have to fit this application. So if you want, if you don't have a real clue, so this could be a very great way that humans intervene. Uh, but humans might say, look, we are not sure, we have a couple of formulas and you can test them with some data and see which one performs the best. And this is what you have done. So combination of both measurement and error or, or confidence, you, you can build any type of formula. So let, let me go to the validations. We have done two major validations, one using opinions. And pro probably this is much stronger because this is a real uh, stock market data set. So these are some numbers and opinion. We are talking about close to 400,000 and let's say users here in Twitter, it's much larger, two millions, and this is number of tweets or whatever. So basically we are talking a lot of data. So again, very fast on opinion, because opinion is great, but data set, but it's dead. I mean, it's kind of has been there and everybody uses. So basically we use the rating as a single measurement. People rate things there and they rate each other. So this is what is great there, because you have two kinds of ratings, things and also each other. So rating of rating. So basically we kind of model all of them. In Twitter, it's much more difficult. So what we have done, we have done, as I said, we went after, uh, after stock market for the reason that uh, it was very difficult to find data which is available and also it's kind of precise. So nobody will give you data, real data in medical field or business field because they, they have many reasons not to do that. But stock market, that's the beauty of it. The data is available and it's very precise in the sense can, doesn't change or you can go one day and one minute and find the stock market of Apple or whatever has the same value. So anyway, what we did here, this is some more details. We, we uh, collected the data of a very large group of investors. So this is so interesting, probably psychology people can explain. 
why people you know a lot of people participate in stock market they make money but also they try to brag i mean basically are large groups of investors and they they give kind of uh, uh, hints uh, kind of direction of what to buy what to sell so basically we collected all those tweets and somehow using some sentiment analysis tool and we consider those as measurement of trust also we divide it in time in the sense that the, new, the, the older information has less value than new information so kind of forget and factor again this comes from some psychology so and then uh, we test it in both uh, systems so in, in opinion and in, in uh, twitter so the first test is it's like this uh, this is kind of standard in the system so suppose you have a b1 and z so basically that kind of triangle so you get information regarding z from b but also you have direct information from a to z so what we did we we, we cut this link so basically we try to predict this with other information so basically this somehow tells you how good that uh, kind of uh, formula you have choosing to to apply for this kind of aggregation and we, we have done a lot of for example you see this uh, in some applications this is the formula number one that the multiplication in some cases this one also was a good candidate so this is what it means to, to test whatever formula you, you thought about how to aggregate trust with your data so anyway so the figure gives kind of better view because so this is opinion this is twitter so this is the range where you have high c and you have kind of good coincidence of predicting that the removed link twitter has more errors and the reason is that here you have kind of very uh, clear ratings precise ratings uh, unfortunately uh, in twitter we, it's kind of much more noise because we, we collect uh sentiment and again there is a lot of error involved on that too so yeah let, let me move a little bit so these are some details comparing with other systems again this is now focus on stock market as i said the only reason we went for stock market because the data is available and in other fields it's very impossible so basically on the large group of 200 in, uh, investors uh, this was clear i mean we know that i mean very few are good at predicting stock market so basically here for example the, the meaning of trust is very pragmatic so we consider somebody more trustworthy if they predict better stock market we don't care if they are doctors if they know how to read if they are whatever but if they are good at predicting stock markets that's how you come up in, in the, <laughs> the ranking so basically we call it power so we kind of uh, basically uh, calculating the, the trust and confidence and summarizing with our former so finally we start with the trust between each pair and we end up with kind of map of trust so this is one view of the map, map of trust so you have very few of these people with high power so, and now the idea is that people have used stock market for a long time to kind of predict stock market uh, values but our point is that instead of kind of summarizing all of them or listening to all of them probably you have to listen to the gurus because these guys get it right i mean yeah there are many which have no clue and that's why you have a stock market most people lose money there anyway so uh, we have kind of compared our using some some methods others have used in, in uh, basically they, they use this uh, formula in which one they have positive and negative kind of assessment from each other and, and we have included here our trust so we have weighted this positive and negative feeling with our trust so finally so this as i said this reflects the map of trust uh, i developed i explained before and we compared with some financial ways to do it again i really don't understand very well how these financial models work but we, we found some, some talking of some, some people, experts in this field. This is kind of uh, what they are trying to catch, this ab abnormal returns. The idea is that if you look at stock market, kind of average of stock market, you won't predict or make money. The real money you make it when you, you, you hit some abnormal. So if you know that tomorrow Apple will jump for whatever reason. And again, they try, they have their own formulas, their own models to, to catch this. Uh, and we consider these are some major companies we consider in the stock market that 
in kind of eight months of data. So here are the, the values, the number of tweets and everything. So basically after we apply, uh, this is the results. So uh, this is our model. So basically we, we consider trust here. Here you can see just followers. Here you consider all of them equal. And the best correlation we have is kind of the real data. Uh, it looks that it's uh, the model when you include. I mean, nothing exceptional here, as I said, after you figure out the gurus, of course, gurus have more uh, power in our decision making and basically they correlate much better than, than non-gurus or kind of uh, even followers, which, and also this could be misleading because you know, Followers doesn't mean that they agree with you or they might be following you for whatever reason. So yeah, th these are some other kind of uh, matching we did. And this is very interesting because you, you can predict three years ago, it looks like three, three years before you can predict what's going to, to happen based on these methods. And this is one result for Amazon trying to catch those abnormal returns because this is where you make money. This day the, you, you, the stock will jump and there is very, no, no way which can tell you. How these people know, I don't know. I've been, honestly, I've been in these groups and they have very weird methods. Some of them use graphs, theories, whatever information, but end result is some of them are very good at predicting stock market. And basically just listening to them, you can make a lot of money. Otherwise, using just other uh, statistical techniques, uh, it's impossible to predict stock market. Anyway, this is some validation. So somebody could build, build a tool out of this and, and most likely have done that. So, so this is the summary for us was very good validation and we needed real data and stock market provided real data. So let me jump to the other big application. This is a big project we are working on. And this is very interesting because has some of those features I discussed before why people should be in the loop, but has more. And we are dealing with uh, kind of uh, uh, handling uh, natural resources, water uh, among farmers, but more than that, I mean, talk also energy and so on, but let me uh, focus on water, fertilizer, whatever they use in the, the kind of activity. And they have to make decisions which are collective decisions. Why? Because we are neighbors. Uh, if left alone, everybody will go for maximum profit, ruin my, my, land, my uh, kind of, soil but also yours and so on so basically there are a lot of theories behind these models and so on but finally and these guys you can produce even optimized solutions but then you cannot impose this solution because they are private owners if you go and tell to them look this year you have to reduce your profit because next year blah blah uh, they won't listen to you and there is no way so basically the only way would be that somehow they collaborate with each other. Somehow I don't want to hurt myself, but also I don't want to hurt you. And somehow the community has this sense, whatever sense it has, for example. And again, this is one clarification that our system doesn't, uh, cannot improve or make community worse. The community has, it, has to have its own kind of moral, whatever we call moral in this case, for example, to defend the environment. And somehow the tool can help them to, to make decision in that direction. But our tool cannot make people uh, somehow nice to environment or, and so on. So basically that's something beyond the scope of this work. So anyway, from each actor point of view is like this, they, they select some, uh, the solutions we will see, they are really pretty optimized. These people use very kind of uh, complex models so to, to have the solution, they are pretty optimized and easy for, for farmers. So it could be not only farmers, could be other stakeholders, uh, kind of uh, agencies which are involved in this. And somehow they have to, to choose among these uh, solutions. And then when they, they choose something, they will get feed, feedback from the others. For so, you know, if somebody selects solution just for their own good and they don't care about anything else, people won't like it. He will get, that person will get low reviews and somehow, this will be kind of feedback mechanism. And hopefully that person will be sensitive to what the community is saying. He might kind of change a little bit or might not change, it depends on the person. Again, we use some game theory here because we haven't involved yet real people. We have talked to them, but not really experiments. And they, they 
as I said, depending on the community, what kind of feedback they get. So this is like trust based loop based on, on feedback on trust and they can change their direction. Okay. And by the way, in some other work, we have modeled this because it's for people familiar with engineering, this is feedback loop and there is control theory, which captures it. And we have done some great work. I'm not presenting here because we don't have time that. So anyway, this is a large project, a real project. So involving a lot of people on this uh, modeling and we are focusing on some region in Oregon. This is a real region of uh, kind of river there and they have done a lot of work regarding land and whatever it's involved there. So, so to make it simple, basically solutions in, include waters. Um, there are two types of waters, crop choice, fertilizer. So there are many choices. As I said, they have worked with, who knows, millions of such kind of uh, points and optimize them and coming up with some solutions which the stakeholder farmers, and we show a very limited set, otherwise it becomes very really crowded. So basically in each stage, actors or farmers or whatever they are, select solutions. And they kind of negotiate in the sense that they get feedback. It's similar to a little bit like how we do reviewing at NSF. So we have a panel, uh, we, we, we say whatever we have to say, and then by, by discussing, we might even change the rating uh, we give to them. So this is kind of converging uh, process. In this case, uh, they care about trust. Why? Because they will be neighbors forever. So basically, if somebody is kind of tinted like a bad person, doesn't care about community, but most likely it will hurt them. So this goes in psychology, as I said, they are even going in the brain mapping now how this fit, uh, fits our, our cortex activity. So anyway, this is the model, which I said, your feedback based on trust. So this is very simplified version of the, the and this is pretty optimized. For example, this is what kind of water, amount of water they use includes. This is summarizing all so choices of crops, which are not showing here. So basically the trade-off, we make it simple, is between profit, everything is normalized, so maximum profit one, maximum uh, environment protection one. But you see, it's kind of trade-off, it's difficult. For example, to, to improve the environment, uh, they have to give up on the profit, and again, how much we have put some limits because uh, realistic people don't expect that people will accept big losses. So anyway, we have uh, the, this uh, collect, like collective decision making and each point is assessed by a distance. So uh, let's say somebody gives a goal, could be an agency or whatever saying, look, as, as a community, you have to reach this goal to protect the environment or whatever goal you have. So basically we calculate trust, as I said, from the feedback they get and somehow the solutions also are, are weighted by the trust. And so uh, basically uh, this is the next slide will be some great, uh, we have a lot of results, but I'm summarizing the, the most important one. We introduced this trust sensitivity. So basically how sensitive a person is to, from the trust they get from the community, from the pressure and Basically, this is the result. So basically, uh, here it is. So the distance, it's basically the maximum. So if left alone, these people will, without anything. So basically, we'll have a line here. Basically, everybody will go for their own profit. And depending on the case, could be the maximum or close to the maximum damage to the environment. Now, if they consider all those uh, other features, as I said, environment and so on, they might start to negotiate. So they might start all of them at this, sorry, to this kind of maximum profit and later on getting feedback, they can starting to, to go closer, closer to something which is more acceptable. Again, this is sensitive, the more sensitive they are, faster they go kind of uh, closer to some, some desirable goal. And here I occur with having five rounds, 10 rounds of negotiation. So basically more negotiation, you can improve more, but also let us be realistic. These people won't stay there forever. So most likely, this could be kind of more realistic. And again, the curve is kind of non-linear because that's the nature of solutions. I and mean, solutions are really not, not uh, linear. And again, whatever place you stop, even if you stop really uh, with minimum sensitivity here, still you, you have a kind of improvement. So this is the point I, I said before. These are not perfect systems. They cannot guarantee that you will really reach whatever goal because it depends on people. Somehow this facilitates the, the 
uh, decision making if people really are sensitive from uh, from from what they get from community. Also, the big question if the community really cares about this. this thing. So if the community is bad, basically if you run this among thieves, you will find the the the, the worst and basically the most the the biggest thief will will, come, will become the guru again. So th this is the meaning of uh, the scheme. So I, I don't know. Please tell me uh, how much time we have so I can go faster or slower. So we have uh, about twenty minutes. Okay. That includes time for questions. Yeah. Anyway, so basically, th this is uh, I, I, I trying to uh, to explain more in details this scheme because we have done a lot of work here and this is work including really people from the field. And what's very interesting talking with really people from the field experts, they warned us since the beginning. So they said, be careful with these optimal solutions and dealing with farmers. Because if you, in theory, you can get all this solution, use some machine learning or whatever, and find the perfect solution. But who is going to impose farmer A, what crop they're going to use? They said, leave me alone. I have a gun here. So, and also they've tried in, this is don't quote me because i just listened to this i mean I, talking to these people somehow in california they tried this uh, to deal with water and, and so-called optimal solutions they were very wrong because they missed some big factors so th this is something else people might bring in the, on the table the models and algorithms they are focused just on the parameters we are dealing with and could be something else totally out the data and somebody from experience or whatever, they can bring on the table and really make the decision towards this, uh, including that, that feature too. Anyway, so let me go more fast than others. So basically there are schemes because I want to, to have some time for questions. Well, could so, I ask a quick question yeah. before we continue? Uh, we have a question here. How does trust sensitivity relate to risk tolerance in financial markets? I expect my return to increase if I accept more risk. Uh, sorry, that's kind of, I'm not expert on that. So basically uh, what you are saying, it's very true. And uh, basically has to, uh, if somebody wants to apply this scheme on stock market, you need some uh, experts from the field. But finally, uh, it's up to you. So basically the, our system could, could summarize what you decide. So that, that's why we consider trust as a measurement. We don't go in the brain only lately I knew that people are working on the brain. I didn't know that. And I don't know, some days they might be able to go inside the brain and really figure out by a scan, I mean, how much risk you can tolerate and so on. But for the time being, we just see the actions of people. So if the actions we summarize with our system, uh, basically it depends on the people. So that's my, my kind of short answer. And I'm not really expert on the uh, financial data. That person said thanks. Okay, thank you. So let me go fast on the other ones. So this is an application. Let us totally change gears here. So no people is involved. So this is a computer system, cloud system. I work on for cloud uh, scenarios. So, and the idea is like this. Suppose you have configuration of machines, virtual machines, whatever they are. We call task application, but could be anything, applications, right? And uh, can we somehow by measurement judge what's the trustworthiness of this system, how much we can trust them? And again, we developed a system we, which, we, we, again, we start with mapping of trust. We, we based on system on, on kind of measurements of uh, network measurements, and we try to get anomalies. You can use any type of techniques, machine learning. Uh, I think they have used machine learning in case of some, to find some flaws which are not normal anomalous and they could be out of range whatever right and then we map these measurements on, on flow level using our model of trust again each um, case it's a measurement trust and, and let's say error or confidence from that one we move to the node model somehow the node model depends uh, on the application on the flow so if you have a node has 10 flows which are bad most likely the trust goes down again we try to capture this so uh, this is kind of abstract, uh, let's say, exercise. If the previous one is a uh, real project, this is, uh, again, uh, we, we are making up this mapping. Somebody else might say, no, I don't want this mapping. I want some other mapping. So uh, 
the, the human expertise goes in. So basically don't take this formula that God given. So, and then we, we go to the application level of trust, again, summarizing nodes and uh, flows. And finally, based on that, we, we, we run kind of, this is kind of test bed scenario. We, we run with some nodes. So we started with node uh, application four, which is bad, starting to send some bad traffic. And then that application here kind of, uh, in fact, I mean, starting to do the same thing. So basically during time, the uh, attack vector is developing and, and we can see that by measurement, but also we can assess by trust. So let's say three time window start everything fine, trust one, one, both measurement and confidence. And then after some time in our simulation, somehow trust goes down. So basically somebody who is handling this, they might know, look, some node, for example, if the trust go be beyond some value, uh, I can even take node down. And the most important thing, I believe, uh, this is just to have started to work on this. We have some preliminaries on a publisher paper. I, I think this is great value. We have this coined a new term, trustability. It means that uh, can you, like, like reli in reliability. In reliability, you can guarantee that something will be available with some, some uh, let's say, probability based on failure of the system or whatever. Here, it's much more difficult. We are saying, can you guarantee me the trust level of a node, a system, or the whole cloud if you know the attack, uh, the, the, the attack vector and the, the uh, probability of the success? So by the way, they're, in real life, they, they have people to do this or experts. I mean, they, and it, it's kind of interesting because they don't hire one expert. They hire many, five or so, because experts might not agree. So somehow they are doing manually this collecting trust to assess probability of what, what will happen. So what we are saying, if you have such, such uh, what if scenarios, and then you can use, this is trustedly somehow to be able to, like in reliability, to have redundancy and be able to, for example, suppose a node goes down or, or basically the trust goes down, immediately you can put another node. For example, cloud is very simple. You, you might have, other virtual machines, other servers, other pods ready there. If something trust goes down, you just immediately replace with something else. So this is very interesting. So basically applying similar concept of uh, reliability, but in security. And I think this would be great because finally uh, somebody can really make a trade off between uh, money, how much, because redundancy costs money and how much trust they want to guarantee. Depends on the application, on customers and so on. So yeah, this is a little bit, uh, we have modified our trust, building this trustability, a little bit more conservative. And we have applied, as I said, in the, the test bed. So I, I, I think this is, in my heart, I believe this could have a really great uh, opportunity to improve things and systems. Uh, now uh, 5G comes with micro clouds or internet of things and so on. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I, I think we talked about this. So uh, just a few words here because I know that I'm out of time now. So we apply this to, to uh, filter fake news and fake users. So again, this is not real data. This is synthetic data because it's not easy to get this data. Uh, basically, the idea would be to collaborate with some Facebook or an Amazon. And most likely, they, they are doing this. I don't know how good because still we get a lot of fake news. So the idea is very simple. Suppose you are able to uh, assess the trust of this, who writes this, or the news itself. And if, you, depends on the criteria you put, your, if you are able to, uh, for example, very simple. If somebody is new in the community, you, the trust level is, is, is low. And also this works in real life because most of these fake news generators, there are people that are hired around the world and they make a lot of money by the way, just to dump. I mean, they give some text and put on whatever media. So basically if they are unknown, you just put level of trust low, you might filter them or you might flag them. For example, Facebook has promised this. I don't know if they are doing, but they have promised that they will kind of put a mark that look, this news is not trustable. So basically, if you are able to do that, you, this graph shows that you can filter. Lower trust, you can put filters, only people with high trust can influence the community. Now, we, we have gone 
beyond this because also this is as you know in security kind of game between attackers and defenders so if you apply this scheme most like the attackers you will find a new way to, to go through so basically they might increase their own trust so how they can increase their own trust they can they can create clusters among themselves and just saying good things about each other and the, the trust level goes up so basically we have prepared our scheming for this scenario so we, we we use much some machine learning techniques to uh, do clustering, but our clustering is based on trust. For example, and we can see features of from the trust point of view to detect cluster of, of attackers. For example, if the, their trust mostly is, uh, it's raised by themselves, most likely and that could happen. Uh, let me be clear: it could be a group of people, friends, or whatever. And that case of trust could develop like that. So it's not kind of uh, one and zero situation. Again, more studies needed here. Or another angle could be that if the trust suddenly goes up, usually these uh, fake uh, people and basically they are hired for some assignment, immediately go there, create accounts, fake accounts, uh, and basically, or they are totally unknown, or as in the other scenario, they might start to increase their own trust, but no matter what they trust will, will go suddenly. If you kind of normal community, you will expect that first of all, the trust doesn't jump like that day X. And also there is some trust from outside, not only from inside community. So the bottom line is that we apply kind of filtering by the community itself. So for example, if somebody is very good friend of mine and, and sends something, I can kind of accept it based on my trust on that person. But if totally somebody I don't know and I see something and more, uh, if I see something which is fake, I know, for example, they might say, look, in your city will be this big event and could be fake. And I will flag that, that is not true. For example, in this case of th this Nobel Prize from Japan, they said that this guy has worked in China. He knows uh, that China did it and blah, blah, blah. And it was very easy to debug because immediately it was clear that the, this guy never worked in China. So it just immediately many people who knew him were able to detect the, the fake news. So anyway, we use some metrics, as I said, density of clusters, uh, how they uh, evolve in time. And these are some data. So basically we judged, for example, this cluster is most likely cluster of fake news people because their trust is internal, also in time, uh, kind of jumped and doesn't change. Normal cluster, usually you have some change. And the final thing, just a few words, we have some uh, collaborators, they do focusing, uh, focusing of crime. They use some machine learning, some uh, techniques to forecast the crime based on the history of crime and everything on geography. So this is what they use, some hotspot uh, model based on point process. And basically they do prediction. And then uh, the interesting thing is that also we have data from the police. So they give this prediction to the police, but in, interesting enough, not always police the, the lead. Sometimes police does something else. And we have compared the data in b both from algorithm and police, what the people does in real life. And we have found any kind of variation. So basically I'm showing you the interesting scenario where the police uh, has better kind of performance. Well, there are cases depending on the region where police, uh, where the algorithm do better or they're almost the same. But you see, in this case, the, the police is doing better. I, we don't know the reason. You have to investigate, it's not easy. But this, this could be indeed that in, in the future, uh, one could have a system which kind of uh, uh, aggregates both results, or even better, somehow uh, go, uh, gives a way to police to investigate why they, they did uh, worse than the machine, or why machine, somehow was the same result and, and this could lead to better decision in predicting crime. So I think that's the end of my presentation. So really, I strongly believe that uh, trust could be kind of very good platform of collaborating between machine people and making decisions using algorithms, artificial intelligence or whatever uh, name we will call in the future. And we have a model of trust I mean, that can be improved. As I said, there are many models, but our, our, this is the, the uh, I, I praise it, very simple and also very flexible. You can change those formulas depending on the application you have in mind, the expertise, and you can apply some, some aggregation. And we applied in several scenarios. We are trying to go in some other scenarios now. And of course, in all these things, it's data is the, the 
very uh, difficult part because I mean it's very it's not easy to, to share this kind of data. For example, we tried with hospitals, but no hospital will give you data to show they have problems and so on. So anyway, so this is my presentation. Thank you very much for attending and I will be glad to answer any question. Thank you, Ariane. Um, I'm going to grab the screen back and um, to allow people to time to type in their questions, I'm going to go through a few things uh, going on with Trusted CI and, and other uh, projects we're connected with. Um, so first, uh, please take our survey. Let me go ahead and throw that in the chat. Uh, we, we use these surveys to get feedback on the presentation, but also to, um, to uh, accept ideas for future topics. Um, so there, I just put the, the URL to our survey in the, um, in the chat box there. So please give us your feedback and uh, let us know if there's other topics you're interested in us presenting on. And then also we've got a, just a few conference updates, obviously with COVID-19 impacting uh, people's ability to come together. A lot of conferences are moving online. Uh, the Great Plains Network annual meeting has moved online and uh, PERC 20 is also going to be transitioned to an online uh, format. We also have the Trusted CI NSF Summit coming up in September uh, 22nd to, through the 24th. No updates on that yet, uh, but please stay Stay tuned for any updates about that event. And um, if you want to learn more about our webinar series or submit requests to present, you could visit us at trustedci.org slash webinars. Our next webinar is May 18th. That's a one week early than our usual time because of the holiday. And so we uh, moved it up one week and our topic is going to be software assurance with uh, Professor Barton Miller. Uh, Bart is a member of Trusted CI. He has extensive experience uh, teaching software assurance and uh, performing uh, vulnerability assessments. So we're very excited to have him uh, present on that topic. And we looks like we got a question uh, coming in here. Uh, oh wait, pardon, we had already read that question. So one last call for questions. Uh, before we wrap things up. And um, while people are typing, I just wanted to say, Ariane, thank you very much for presenting. This is very interesting. Thank you. For I was, uh, yeah, uh, you're welcome. I was telling um, my co host, Jim, that I would love to go on coffee walks with you and talk about this, you know, the dangers of AI and the Terminator. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, what the reality of a, of a Terminator like scenario could be, you know, for us to. Uh, to go through. Um, yeah, but it could be much earlier than the Terminator because it could be in many <laughs> shapes, even decision making for, for our blood work or our diagnosis and all of those things. And this. Yeah, exactly. There's a lot of interesting what if scenarios that, that we need to start uh, talking about. Um, so I think I think we're going to wrap up, but uh, thank you everyone for attending the presentation. And thanks again, Ariane. Um, I will be p posting slides to this as well as the video, hopefully later today. Thank you um, very much to every, everybody and special to you who invited me. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, everybody, I hope you have a great day and uh, see you next time. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.